those are thirty dollars for thirty minutes or fifteen dollars for fifteen minutes. Sign up online for both of those. Um, I think that's really all we have wrapping up the semester. So I'm going to pass it over to Cheryl Mirabella, and she's going to get started with our presentation today. All right. Thank you, Leah. Hello. Welcome. Um, it's nice to see a pretty full room on a rainy midday. I guess lunch does pull people in sometimes, right? <laughs> Um, so, yes, my name is Cheryl Mirabella. I'm a nutritional health coach. Uh, I have a private practice I'm in, in Old Town Alexandria. And additionally, I work for some integrative medical doctors as well in Alexandria, working with their patients who are trying to use food as medicine and understanding that through right lifestyle, being food, managing stress, exercise, that many, many changes can be made and disease processes reversed and prevented. Um, and additionally, when I'm not doing that, I'm all around town doing talks like this. So I'm here on behalf of Kaiser today. And so I'm delighted to present a topic that I think is kind of timely. How many of you are just still getting over all the how many pies were at your Thanksgiving table? So we're in the, what I call the sugar season, right? We're in the sugar season. And um, what I tell my clients is you crave what you eat. You ever notice that? So when we talk about you know, looking at sugar and looking at maybe having to give up sugar, I usually tell people, well, it is kind of like a drug, and we are kind of addicted, and so usually it's really hard at first to lower the amount of sugar that comes into our life, but then once we do, the cravings do go down. So that's kind of the good news little piece there. But um, today what we're going to cover is quite a bit. Um, we're going to talk about the basics of sugar, sugar substitutes, and sodium. Um, learn about the health effects um, of sugar and sugar substitutes. Learn about safety of sugar substitutes. And tips to help reduce sugar and sodium intake. And then, of course, resources to help you. So before we get going with that, um, I'd like to just say that this is um, not to replace your physician's advice or recommendations, that this is simply an educational uh, program. So do not stop seeking the advice of your medical professional. And additionally, just know that this information is, um, if anything were to be discussed in here that's personal to you, that would remain in here. If you want to share the information from an educational point of view, of course, you're free to share that, just keeping personal information private. So um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what, natural sugars versus artificial sweeteners. And I also want to make this uh, really kind of interactive as well. I, don't, I really don't want to just be talking at you. Um, the whole time, but uh, what we do know is that sugar is everywhere and in everything. And um, how many of you are kind of aware of uh, sugar being something that you maybe want to do less of in your life? Yeah. How many of you, is there anyone here who has actually been successful at really reducing the amount of sugar that you used to maybe consume? No? OK. <laughs> um, so I consider myself a recovering um, high sugar person. <laughs> so I was a person who was very addicted to sugar and anything that turned into sugar very quickly. And if I walked into a mall and I smelled, um, what was this, Annie's? Yeah, <laughs> she knows what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, like, uh, like, you know, just, and, and so, but I was also extremely tired all the time, really low energy, kind of mood swings. And so kind of now that I'm not really consuming that much sugar, I notice a big difference in how I feel and in my, ener you know, my energy. And there's a lot of science now coming out about um, how sugar is actually leading to some, many of our health conditions, um, including, of course, diabetes 2, which is at epidemic levels, obesity, which is at epidemic levels. And now we're actually seeing kind of a shift and seeing how sugar can, is affecting our cholesterol even more so than fat. Um, so what we're finding is that foods that break down into sugar rapidly, like simple carbohydrates and added sugars, actually kind of get a free pass through your liver and then become, you know, break down into cholesterol um, much more quickly. So there's a lot of kind of science that's shifting a little bit in these last 10 to 12 years. And so um, we're taking a harder, closer look at sugar. So we actually have, of course, naturally occurring sugars. So naturally occurring sugars are found in our fruit, so we call them fructose. And then uh, lactase, lactose, which is found in milk products. Um, added sugars are everything else that's made into sugar, such as um, 
uh, sucralose, which is, and, and you'll notice there's a lot of OSEs next to, so there's something like 50 different names for sugars, just so you know. So if you're reading labels and you don't see the word sugar, you want to keep reading and, uh, and if you see something that ends in an OSE or an IO, an OL, there's probably, it's probably a sugar. You're going to see a lot of these words as we go through today, but table sugar, so that's made from beet juice or sugar cane, raw sugar, which is simply evaporated sugar cane. So a lot of people think, oh, isn't that better? It's brown, right? Well, the only difference is it's, it hasn't been, um, you know, uh, stripped and with like a chemical to make it white but it's still sugar. Raw sugar is still sugar. Uh, brown sugar, sugar crystals, it has molasses syrup added to it. So again, people say, oh, isn't brown sugar better? Well, you know, it has molasses, which maybe has some minerals, but it's still sugar, sugar, sugar. Um, confectionery sugar is just finely grinding that sucrose into a powdered sugar. And then um, uh, turbinado is, is less refined. It's made from cane juice. So again, it's just, it's still sugar, it just hasn't been refined as greatly is, is the difference. Does it still uptake in your body as rapidly as table sugar? Yes. So just to be, you know, sometimes we see these nice little packets with a brown, you know, it says raw, and you're like, that's got to be better, right? It's not that different. So high fructose corn syrup, um, you probably heard a lot about, right? And so that is really what many health professionals and um, are really contributing to most of our health problems. When high fructose corn syrup came into the marketplace, it became a very inexpensive and readily available um, product made from corn. And so it became something that got added to most all processed foods and it made the big gulp and you know all our tall drinks very inexpensive. And when you can get a drink this size as the same as we used to get at this size, then you're just you're consuming more. So it's very controversial. Um, I think um, in some cities have even outlawed it. New York City um, does not, uh, you know, has, has made, um, I'm sorry, trans fat, sorry, sorry, back, back, back up. They have not outlawed high fructose corn syrup in New York City. No, what they have done is made it much harder to get um, um, trans fats in New York City restaurants. Um, but high fructose corn syrup is, is controversial because of, of how, it, again, what it does is that your body very rapidly processes it through your liver and you really don't have any opportunity to burn it up as fuel. Okay, so if you were to eat, say, a bowl of oatmeal and you would break those oats down into sugar because all carbohydrates eventually break down into sugar, it would take your body a couple hours to, to pull that sugar out of that grain and make it into sugar usable glucose in your body. But when you're literally giving yourself an injection, so to speak, of a straight sugar, like a high fructose corn syrup, you're, you get it instantly. You're, you, as a minute you start drinking it, say, in a soda, your brain gets the message and sends a message to your pancreas to produce a lot of what? Insulin. And the job of insulin is to do what? Break down sugar. Is to put that, make that sugar available into your body you know, for um, energy and to deal with that sugar that's coming in and to put that sugar into your cells. Um, the problem is when it comes in really rapidly, like in a pro highly processed corn syrup like this, um, again, your body doesn't have an opportunity to, to really use it up before it goes right through the liver and then it gets stored as what? Fat. Fat. Right. So, so it's kind of like a really fast system. Um, so it, it also, you know, we are, as a country, we are subsidizing corn. Our federal government subsidized corn. And so it's very inexpensive um, for the food manufacturers who produce high fructose corn syrup. So that's why it's, again, very much more inexpensive to have products that have high fructose corn syrup in them than the real thing. Um, and then it does have an impact on the environment as well as it depletes the soil of nutrients. So we also have natural sweeteners. So again, this is like the number one question clients ask me. Well, so the natural sweeteners are okay, right? I can have honey, I can have molasses, I can have maple syrup, I can have, you know, is that okay, right? Well, they are slightly better only because there are some nu nutrient values. You know, molasses has a lot of iron. It has a lot of other nutritional things to it. Um, honey does as well, and it has antibacterial qualities and things of that nature, but it's still sugar. It's, our body still processes it pretty similarly to any other sugar, just to let you know. Um, 
they all have calories, um, but the added, these, these more natural sugars sometimes have, again, some added minerals. So there's a slight bit of benefit than just a really highly processed sugar. Um, so <laughs> you may have heard of agave nectar came on the scene with a roar about 10 to 12 years ago, and everyone was touting it as the wunder new sugar, and I can, oh, agave, it doesn't affect my blood sugar. Let me put it all over these pancakes. <laughs> well, it's very sweet, and as many of these um, artificial sweeteners or even some of these natural sweeteners like agave and stevia, they are many, many, many times sweeter than even table sugar. So you can have anywhere from like 300 to like 3,000 times sweeter to the taste with some of these sweeteners. So you don't need very much is kind of the point here. Um, and one of the problems with that is that we become very accustomed then to having everything taste really strongly sweet. So you just want to be aware that if you're using them, there is some benefit to having a small amount of agave or a small amount of stevia because it does not affect the blood sugar as rapidly, but you only need a very small amount because your, your taste is still recognizing a lot of sugar. And we're going to get into that in a, in a little bit. So these are just, again, some forms of natural sugars. Um, so what are the problems with um, consuming sugar? Um, so here's what's interesting, is that our body actually, in order to process out added sugar, we actually pull minerals out of our body to do so. So it's kind of a double whammy. We're not getting any added nutrition, and we're actually pulling minerals out of our body in order to process the sugar out. So it's pulling from our bones, it's pulling you know, magnesium and calcium and, and some very important minerals. So it does cause nutritional deficiencies in that way, but it also causes deficiency because if we're eating sugar-laden things and not eating good food, right? So if your kid's choosing candy over an apple, then you're missing out on the nutrition that you might get if you were to substitute something healthier. We all know that sugar leads to tooth decay, and so, you know, Obviously, we want to practice good hygiene if we're eating sugar. I always describe it as, I feel like there's sweaters on my teeth when I eat sugar. When it sits there, you know, you, you go and you have a dessert, and you're like, can't get home, wait to get home and brush my teeth. Um, obviously, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, it leads to obesity because, again, um, let me just stop actually back up a minute and just ask a question. How many grams of added sugar do you think that our body needs each day? She's saying 20-something. Added sugar. For me or Added. Added. <laughs> There's a difference in right. word. So how many how grams many of different. added sugar do you think that we need each day to function? Zero. Yeah, so that was kind of a trick question. But, but a lot of times people will say, well, I know I need a certain amount of fat. I need a certain amount of fiber, a certain amount of protein, a certain amount of carbohydrates. So how many grams of sugar am I supposed to have? I'm like, zero. We don't need one single gram of added sugar for our bodies to function ideally. Why? Where are we getting our sugar from? From all of our carbohydrates that break down into sugar. So our broccoli breaks down into sugar. Our brown rice breaks down into sugar. Our sweet potato. All of that breaks down into usable form of glucose for our energy. So we don't need to function a single gram just to kind of get that out there. Do we use it? Yes. Do we like it? Yes. Can we have some? Yes. But just to be, just to kind of put it out there from a nutritional point of view, we don't need a single gram. Does anyone know how many grams of sugar, um, how many grams are in a teaspoon of sugar? Four. Okay, so there's four grams of sugar in a teaspoon. So if you are um, looking at food labels, for example, you want to keep that in mind, um, you know, how many grams, you know. So if you're looking at a Sprite that says it has 28 grams of sugar, you divide that by four, and that's how many teaspoons of sugar you have in there. Um, so why it leads to obesity is what I mentioned earlier, is that we can't possibly burn up the rapid ingestion of, of sugar that's added as quickly as we consume it. It's just, it's just impossible. Now, if we're eating a, a whole foods diet when we're eating an apple or we're eating, you know, again, carbohydrates that come from nature, we, and we are moving our body, we have a chance to maybe burn that up and not have it rapidly go, get stored as fat. But if we're taking in 
or natural, you know, healthy carbohydrates, and then on top of that, we're adding in a lot of sugar, then it's pretty hard. We're always kind of like trying to catch up to that. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to do. Um, it does lead to heart disease because it does raise our cholesterol, as I mentioned earlier, and it also creates a lot of inflammation in the body, which we know now we're, we're seeing the links between <coughs> inflammation and heart disease, as well as many other health conditions. Any questions on this slide? Uh, a lot. <laughs> I really don't know. I haven't looked at a Coke, but, but you know, a small Coke probably. I mean, do, do you know? I don't know. Um, at, le at least. I mean, here's what's interesting. So I know, like, um, how many years ago Clinton took on the, uh, Bill Clinton took on the whole obesity epidemic with our kids, and they took the uh, soda machines out of the schools. And what did they put in them? Juice. Yeah, juice. So, and Gatorade. And so we still, we got rid of the soda, but we, we just replaced it with another very high sugary drink. So again, it's still the same problem. If you're drinking a tea, I should tell the tea story <laughs> down here last time I was here. Um, but you know, your teas that look healthy, you know, it's a green tea and you look on the label and it's, you know, 28 grams of sugar. And what you may not realize is when you, that it might say per serving, right? So it might say 28 grams of sugar per serving, but then you look and the bottle is two servings. So now you have to multiply that times two if you drink the whole bottle. It's a lot of sugar. Yes. So when you're looking on the labels, I always look for carbs, and then I'm supposed to look for sugar too? Absolutely. So do you add those together to get the total? How do you calculate that? Yeah, so you just, you know, really the goal is to have the least amount of sugar coming in possible. And when you said 20, that's actually the American Heart Association's recommended not to exceed amount of added sugar per day. It's somewhere between 20 and 25. So that's probably what you were remembering when you first answered that question. So that's what the American Heart Association is recommending, that we try not to exceed 20 to 25 grams, which you could do in half a soda. You know, so, so yeah, you, you, the, and the sugar, the carbohydrates in a drink would be coming from the sugar. So it's just, you know, just focus on the sugar. And try to get oh, that okay, down. Not the carbs. Well, in that case, it's the carbs are coming from the sugar. That's their, okay. the only source. So for my clarity, because I'm a type 2 diabetic, mm -hmm. um, they, they calculate everything and they tell you, you know, so many carbs a day. Right. So I focus on carbs. Right. You're telling me I should probably well, both. no, I'm, I'm, you should probably focus on both, especially okay. since you're diabetic. But, just know that if the sugar's low, the carbs will be low, okay. is I guess what I was trying okay. to say. Okay. Yes. But there are some cases where you have carbs without added sugar. So, of course, you're still looking at the carbs, okay. right? right? So, you know, like, for example, you know, a bowl of oatmeal. You might not add any sugar, but there's still carbs in that bowl right. of oatmeal. Okay. So, um, obviously, um, we have sugar substitutes that have been around. And for some people, they use them frequently, and some people... Uh, you know, find them to be somewhat controversial. And as I went through these slides, you know, what, what you'll find is that the science and the studies are still very controversial. You know, you'll have studies that say in, in lab animals that, you know, we're going to cause this and that, and then they can't seem to replicate them in humans. Um, but there's still a lot of people that um, do, are a little cautious about artificial sweeteners. Um, they are chemically altered. They do have chemicals added to them. So I think there are some unknowns. But they're also used for freshness and product quality. Um, they help preserve jams and jellies. They help, um, they, they create like a, a you know, sometimes a, a, a more inexpensive way to sometimes have a processed food. Um, provides fermentations for breads, pickles, bulk to ice cream. So it's, they're used in a lot of ways that people wouldn't think. So they're actually put into the category of a food supplement. So, um, and of course, um, a supplement is something added to your food. It's not an actual natural food. So anything that is not naturally produced is considered a supplement. Um, and so again, there's so many different ways to take in Supplements, so not only added sweeteners, but you know, our, all our supplements that are vitamins and things like that fall into that same category. And people often ask me, um, you know, if I'm not eating very well, if I take a good supplement or a few, is that does that make up for it? 
and I just remind them that it's called a supplement for a reason. We still need a whole foods diet. We still need to be getting all of our macronutrients and micronutrients from actual food. We can't, we need the fiber, we need the antioxidants. So supplements can be helpful to fill some gaps, but they don't replace a healthy diet. So just to be clear about that. Um, okay, so again, a lot of these um, uh, artificial sweeteners and sugar substitutes are regulated by the FDA. And so they're constantly testing and doing um, studies on the many, many different ones. And they, they come up with you know, their support and saying that these are relatively safe. Um, there are certain amounts um, that are recommended um, to not exceed. And so I think most, most um, artificial sweeteners, it's not really recommended that you do more than maybe one or two a day according to the FDA. So artificial sweeteners, sugar alcohols, and novel sweeteners. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. So again, artificial sweeteners are just that. They're synthetic. So they're derived from something natural, but then they're, they're you know, if you were to look it up, you know, scientifically on Wikipedia, you would see many different kinds of scientific um, chemical breakdowns. Um, but oftentimes they start with some kind of um, natural sugar and then they, similar to drugs actually. When you think about many drugs come from natural sources and then there's a chemical process that, that makes them uh, what they are. So here are some that you probably recognize. Um, Sunnet and Sweet One, Equal, which is, and NutraSuit, which is, um, has been around a long time. <laughs> Saccharin is Sugar Twin, Sweet and Low, and Sucralose, which is Splenda. So a lot of times people confuse Splenda with Stevia. So those are different. Um, and I'll talk about Stevia in a little bit. But these are all have been around a long time. And there's controversy. You know, some people, I've had clients, for example, who um, found that they had migraines from using, you know, they, they got rid of the artificial sweeteners and their migraines went away. Um, so also there's a lot of controversy around do they really help with weight loss? And we'll be talking about that. But I'll just say this now is that in the last few years, there's been a lot more research looking at the people who use artificial sweeteners actually lose weight or are there less numbers of obese in that category? And actually, no. Then the first study I saw was out of Cornell um, about 10 years ago. And it basically said that what happens is it, it, when you're having a very intense sugar experience, it kind of creates a, more, a stronger hunger response in you for the rest of the day. So people who use artificial sweeteners tend to have a, a greater appetite. So they tend to overall eat more. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, how about if coffee creamers, since they're all light, they burn out the yes. alcohol yes. while they're in the last yeah. stream. Are those probably from? Yes. So most of those do have some sort of sweetener in them, either sugar or an artificial sweetener. So yeah. So you have to look at everything. You know, I, I, that happened to me. I was traveling for Thanksgiving, and I stopped to get a coffee, and there was a creamer. It was like a hazelnut creamer, and I put a little in. And, and then I added a little sugar, and I was like, ah, <laughs> to like dump it out. It was so, I hadn't looked, me, I know. I didn't look at the, I thought it was just, you know, but it was so sweet, I couldn't, I couldn't drink it at all. So there was a lot of sugar in the creamer, and then I put like one thing of sugar, and that was just too much, I had to start over. But yeah, they tend to, a lot of people use those as their sweetener in their coffee. So yeah, yeah, so you don't usually need to add sugar as well when you're using those. Um, so back to the, uh, the weight, the obesity connection with artificial sweeteners. Um, so what happens is a couple things happen. So first of all, when you have the sugar, it, uh, the artificial sweetener, and it's an intense sweetness to your, to your taste, um, it sends a message to your body this, in the same kind of way as when you're taking in, you know, sweetened, naturally sweetened foods, that your blood sugar spikes and then it drops, and so you get kind of a, a little bit of a, a up and a down feeling. So when you're down, what do you crave? more sugar, right? So you're on that roller coaster ride and when your energy drops, you're looking for more sugar. So people tend to still have that up and the down. Um, now it is, they are without calories. This is true. The, sh the artificial sweetener itself does not have the calories. So that's where a lot of people gravitate towards that because they're like, I'm not getting all the calories that would be in a soda. Um, so there's a benefit there. You're saving in the calories. But what you have to watch for is, are, are you noticing that you're eating more? Is your appetite more? And, 
And I always say, you know, it's always kind of funny. You, you, you go to a fast food restaurant and you see somebody loading up on, you know, you, it kind of gives you permission, like, well, I'm saving here. I can have more here, right? Does anyone ever do that? Like, I can go with the extra large fries since I just had the, um, the, um, the Diet Coke. So. so sugar alcohols are kind of a little bit newer. Um, you have seen them showing up, and, and you'll see them in, like, like bars, like, uh, you know, um, what do you call them? Um, uh, you know, the, the bars that you can get, you know, the power bars, things of that nature. And they use a lot of, and they'll say no sugar and no sugar added because they're not counting these as sugars. And the sugar alcohols um, are kind of interesting how they work in the body is that your body does not break it down in the same way, again, as it does sugar. And so um, you're not absorbing the sugar as often. Now, because of that, a lot of the sugar alcohols cause kind of a little bit of gastric upset in some people. Sometimes they're gassy um, because they're not processing in the same way a natural sugar would. But um, some of these are, are OK. And like especially the xylitol is, has a double purpose. It's actually good for uh, dental hygiene. So you'll see sometimes chewing gum, some natural chewing gums that have xylitol in it. It's protective of. And, and basically what, it, what they are is they're, they're coming from fermented foods, like mushrooms and, and different natural things. So the, the source is usually starting with something natural, and then they go through some chemical changes to become a um, sweetener. But you'll see them in candy, frozen desserts, chewing gum. You see them a lot in mouthwashes and toothpaste, again, because of the benefits there. And um, so. Um, so some of the newer sweeteners, again, has anyone uh, been using stevia? So stevia, again, is a natural, and it comes from a plant. You know, you can grow a stevia plant. You can take off a leaf, just, and you can chew it, and it's sweet. And so you can get a very unprocessed stevia, and, um, and it's basically just the leaf. Um, and I usually recommend my clients looking for something called sweet leaf. And you can get it in a little tincture bottle. And it's, it has a much better taste than when they chemicalize it into um, Truvia. And it tastes more chemical-like when it becomes a powder. So if you just want a little taste of something sweet, my favorite and most highly recommended sweetener is the stevia. And to just get it in a little bottle, you can get it at Trader Joe's. And it's everywhere now. But um, they even have ones that are flavored, like vanilla and hazelnut. So you could use a little few drops of stevia into your coffee and get the, the natural hazelnut flavor and, and the stevia. So, um, so there's a lot out there. There's a lot of different things. And I know that it's confusing. Um, but you can use these to bake, whereas some of the artificial sweeteners don't work as well in baking. So. So again, the health benefits of artificial sweeteners are that you are not taking in this, the sugar that's actually going to decay your teeth. In some cases, it can help with weight control as long as you are just cognizant. Um, if it does affect your, you know, and everybody's different. See, I just want to be sure to say that too. So some people might have an artificially sweetened drink and not notice an increase in their appetite as long as they're basically also eating a healthy, balanced diet. Um, other people may notice that, that they get that spike and drop and maybe need to be more careful. Um, so again, diabetes, diabetic, my diabetic patients are the ones that are most um, paying attention to this. And they want to know, is it OK to use the artificial sweeteners? And how much sugar should I have? And so again, um, I think you can use, all, you can use the artificial sweeteners um, sparingly and cautiously. But I wouldn't say just give free license to use as much as you want because of the things that I mentioned earlier. And with added sugar, I think it's in re really important that you consider that you don't really need it and use it more like as a special treat. Um, and again, you crave what you eat. So if you're eating a lot of sugar, you're going to crave it. And things don't taste as sweet. But if you go off sugar for, like, say, a week, I mean, a banana becomes too sweet to handle. Have you had that? You're nodding. Have you had that experience? So like usually a couple times a year I go, um, I do kind of a cleanse and I get rid of sugar and a lot of other foods. And, and I remember the first time I did it, one of my colleagues led the cleanse. And you know we took out sugar and meat and alcohol and everything good, right? Bread. <laughs> it was like after the holidays. And you're grumpy. You're really grumpy like the first three days. You know, it really, it's like you're withdrawing from a drug. And, and then after about the third or fourth day, you kind of level out. 
and your balance, you get, kind of get balanced and you start finding almonds are sweet and apples are sweet and you're, you're good with that. But then when you reintroduce something that's sweet after not having added sugar in for a week, 10 days, you really can't eat it. It's too, too sweet to your taste. And so I just want to encourage you that it only takes a few days. It doesn't take months, years. Even if you feel like you've been a sugar addict or a sugarholic for years and decades, it only takes a, really a few days to lose that intense craving for sugar. Now, you may not lose the, um, you may lose the compulsion, you may never lose the craving. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So, you know, if you are walking in a Starbucks for a coffee and you see the pumpkin muffin, uh, you may still want it, but you can say no. Whereas if you're eating sugar, you're more likely to say, hand over that pumpkin muffin. <laughs> so just keeping that in mind. So here's some of the studies, um, again, uh, with sugar substitutes and cancer. So there have been studies that showed saccharin um, and bladder cancer in, in um, mice and rats. Um, and then there were possible links. Um, to, uh, again, to brain tumors, but again, they couldn't seem to replicate or uh, really uh, be sure of this. So there's, there's these, these studies that have been out there and have been floating around, but there's not a whole lot of definitive, yes, this is factual in humans. So some people say, well, if this causes this in lab rats, maybe I don't want to be a lab rat too. So, you know. Um, and again, um, sucralose, 100 safety studies about cancer, no evidence supporting cancer, and no clear evidence that the artificial sweeteners available commercially in the United States are associated with cancer risk in humans. So that's kind of what currently is out there. Um, so that's, you know, so if you're hearing things, you're hearing things and it's kind of your choice. You know, if you wanna, if you wanna take any risks or just believe many studies. Um, so health benefits of sugar substitutes. I think, what, am I going the wrong way? Yep. Okay. So um, sugar substitutes and weight gain. So here's when we're talking about what I was talking about before. So 3,682 adults over a seven to eight year period showed that drinkers of artificially sweetened beverages had higher BMIs at the follow-up with dose dependence on the amount of consumption. So again, this is that that link between using artificial sweeteners actually then seeing people who have higher BMIs. Um, and then again, users gained weight compared to non-users. Um, so just be aware that there are some benefits, but not necessarily giving us the weight uh, reduction that we're hoping for, for the reasons that I mentioned, because our, and our cravings for sweet stay are up and down blood sugar spikes and drops. Um, so if we're, if we're still eating lots of things that taste really sweet, we always still want things that taste really sweet. So that. So many of these sweeteners are, um, like I said, a lot sweeter. So you really don't need very much. Um, so here's the, the common sweeteners um, and so 15 milligrams of the acyl sulfame K and um, the aspartum. So it's, it's not, again, this is 50 milligrams of body weight per day. So, um, and then sucralose, which is the Splenda and the saccharin, you know, so that's, you know, not a ton because of, of how sweet it is. So here's the U.S. Dietary Guidance for Sugar Intake. So six teaspoons a day for women and one teaspoon. What? That doesn't look right. <laughs> nine teaspoons a day. Um, something's wrong there. But anyway, it's nine teaspoons a day for men and six teaspoons a day for women. Um, and I would just encourage you to, to, so that's not a lot when you think about how many teaspoons are in um, a typical. So here you go. A regular soft drink, 132 sugar calories, cakes and pies, so it's a lot. And then oftentimes people don't think about the fruit drinks and or the grains, like how the bagel and anything made with white flour breaks down into sugar very rapidly. One of my favorite books on this subject, if this is something that's of great interest to you or if you are dealing with diabetes or prediabetes, 
um, or even just unbalanced blood sugar. Um, there's a book called The Blood Sugar Solution by Dr. Mark Hyman. It's a fantastic book. And uh, he also was featured in a movie by Katie Couric called Fed Up. It came out about maybe two years ago. And you can see it on Netflix now. And they really looked, the whole movie was all about sugar. And they looked at how addictive it is. And they, they actually had like lab rats. And they had a choice between um, uh, heroin or cocaine. I think it was cocaine and sugar. And they picked the sugar every time. It was, it's that addictive. So there's just being aware of that. But he also looked at how, um, again, a lot of us don't look at the simple carbs, the white bread, the white rice, the wraps, the pizza, the pasta. All of those are become very rapidly break down into sugar in our body. So I look at those kind of as sugar too, even though they don't, they're not sweet. I know they become sugar much more rapidly in my body than a, a whole unprocessed grain. So a, a brown rice or a steel-cut oatmeal is much better than an instant oatmeal, for example, or white rice. Questions on that? Anyone? Yes. yes. It seems that uh, there is sugar everywhere. Yes. So you're right about, so, the, the, so fruit does have varying degrees of, of sugar, but because it's um, in a food, and there's, it's not the same, you know, because there's fiber. It's not quite the same as having added sugar. Now, there is a, what we call a glycemic index, which rates how rapidly foods break down into sugar in your body. So with my diabetic clients, we would go over that together. And for example, bananas and all the tropical fruits are much higher in naturally occurring sugar. So I usually ask them to maybe not never have them, but that wouldn't be their go-to fruit if they're trying to either lose weight or manage their sugar. A, a banana, a very ripe banana, or a papaya, or a mango is going to be much higher in sugar than, say, some berries or an apple. So you can look. You can find a glycemic index. Um, it says how many, how much, you know, how quickly something breaks down into sugar in your body, and choose it based on that. Um, now, anytime you're eating. Um, something that is a little bit higher in sugar, if you add protein and fat with it, so say you had a banana, but you maybe dipped it in some almond butter or natural peanut butter, just by adding the protein and the fat, you're slowing down that rise of your blood sugar. So it's always wise to be thinking when you eat food, to combine it ideally with some healthy fat and some protein and a healthy carbohydrate. And so if you're having an apple snack in the afternoon, an apple's great. But it may not take you from 3 till 7 or 2 till 7, whereas if you had it with some almonds, the fat and the protein and the nuts are going to carry you longer and keep you more stable. And that's really what it's all about. It's really trying to keep ourselves stable so we're not having these peaks and these drops. Because when we're dropping, what does it feel like down there? What does it feel like when you're having a blood sugar crash? Describe. Shout out. What do you, what do you feel in your body? When, you're, when your blood sugar's dropped down, like after you say you had a couple donuts or a sugary you're drink, and then you're tired, right? What else? Does anyone get shaky or grumpy? Foggy, right? So now you have to go in front of a class and teach, right? And you're feeling this way. So that's a, you know, you're getting danger, danger, danger signal. You know where to go get the M&Ms, right? You want to get out of that place and fast. And so you know how to do that. You know how to get caffeine and sugar. And then you're right back up here until you crash again, right? So the idea is to try to keep yourself a little bit more, you know, like here and here versus here and here. And so by just adding, you know, even if I eat chocolate, I'm going to eat chocolate with almonds in it because that, the almonds are going to help. <laughs> I know that. Or, the, if, if, you know, or even if you're eating the peanut M&Ms, that's better than the plain because you've got at least a peanut in there, right? So... All right. Did that answer your question? So fruits are fine. Fruits are, you know, not in excess if you're dealing with diabetes, but um, it's a different kind of thing. So we want to be reading the label. Um, and it is, uh, you know, you really, they can label something sugar-free if it has less than a half a gram of sugar in it. Um, so you want to be looking for things that are reduced sugar. Like, for example, a really good example of this is if you're looking for a jam, a jelly or a jam. And some of them have tons, like, you know, it'd be 15 grams of sugar in a teaspoon. 
lots of added sugar. I'm thinking, well, why do you need to add all that sugar to a sweet fruit? And so then you can find ones that are not, no added sugar, and maybe it's five grams of sugar per teaspoon. So you've just lost 10 grams per teaspoon, and it probably still tastes really good. So this is the thing you want to start looking for. Like, I look at every label except the hazelnut creamer on my way to Thanksgiving. But I typically, you know, you look at your ketchup, look at your tomato sauce, look at everything to see, you know, how many grams of sugar, and then decide, is this, is this you know, is there a better one? Is there one that's less sugar? Um, and then if you can, you know, try to find things that are, um, you know, certainly have less sugar. Dried fruits are very high in sugar, just the nature of the drying them makes the sugar more concentrated, so just keep that in mind. It's not to say you can't have it, but you know, and then they sometimes add sugar to dried fruit, which is like, what? Um, so you don't need to do that. Um, so low sugar, not defined or allowed as a claim on food labels. So again, there's so many different labels. Um, in the movie, Fed Up, you know, they flash this poster with like 50 different names. And you're like, wow, no wonder we're all confused. But um, some of these we'd recognize. We'd recognize um, sugar, obviously, corn sweetener, fruit juice concentrate, honey, molasses. And again, you see all the OSEs and anything, even brown rice syrup, anything that's syrupy is sweet. So. Um, so as much as you can, um, you know, just don't necessarily have it your go-to thing. Maybe don't keep it right at the table. Limit sugar, added sh sugars in foods. Buy uh, sugar-free if you can. Um, use fresh fruit. Avoid canned, um, you know. So again, you have your canned syrup, um, your canned fruits, and you have some with syrup, and some are just with without. And the fruit's sweet anyway. So. Um, Add fresh or dried fruit to oatmeal, yogurt, and ice cream. So I always suggest, for example, buy plain oat, uh, yogurt and then just add your own fruit to it to sweeten it. You know, because does anyone have any, has anyone read a yogurt label lately? And how many grams of sugar? It's a lot. Like a six ounce could have up to 26, 28 grams of sugar. Now probably seven to nine of that is the naturally occurring sugar in the lactose. So you can't get a sugar-free yogurt because the milk has sugar but you can get one that is nine grams versus 28 grams, okay, so. Um, so a really good way, to, you know, oftentimes again, what we end up doing is over-sugaring and over-salting our food, and if we start using herbs and natural foods, things just tend to taste better. Like for me, this time of year, I do a lot of roasting of vegetables, so sweet potatoes and butternut squash and um, fennel and all of these things, and when you roast them, you, you notice how they get kind of car brown. That's the sugar. Caramelization is the naturally occurring sugar in that vegetable, which comes to the surface. So anyone in your house who doesn't really like vegetables and you roast them up some, some, you know, roasted root vegetables, you're gonna, they're gonna taste the sweet the minute they take a bite, and they're gonna start liking their vegetables. So mix up some of the starchier sweet vegetables in with non-starchy vegetables like cauliflower, broccoli, things like that that are you know, really very low in sugar. Um, substitute un, uh, sweetened applesauce. So, um, you know, this is the time of year you're doing a lot of baking. So just Google your favorite recipe and say uh, low sugar, no sugar um, pumpkin bread or applesauce bread. And, you know, <laughs> the funny story, I was making these little breads for my son's school many years ago. And I always do low sugar. And um, they, People like them, they turn out well. I usually do half the amount of sugar than the recipe calls for and people love them. But this one year I was doing like four different recipes all at the same time and I was kind of just playing around with stuff and I completely left the sugar out of <laughs> this one bread I made. And I, my son sat down, I gave him one, I'm like, here honey, this is what you're bringing to your teachers tomorrow. And um, he's like, blah, you know, it's like I completely left no sugar at all, so don't do that. But, um, you know, cutting it down, there's usually enough sugar if you even cut it in half. If it calls for two cups of sugar in a banana bread and you're using like three really ripe bananas, you got a lot of sugar in there. So you can, in some recipes, you can also use the zero calorie um, sweeteners as well. Um, so now we're moving on to sodium. So sodium is, again, when we're eating highly processed foods, there's sodium in everything. And so um, just a lot of times people will say to me, well, can I not have a can of soup? I'm like, look at your overall intake for the day. So if you made your breakfast at home and you're eating your dinner at home, you know, maybe you're going to get a higher sodium lunch. That's okay. You have to look at the collective for your day. So um, 
for most adults, we're looking at 2,300, which is a teaspoon of salt. And so it's not a lot to get to that 2,300. Um, and then people who have high blood pressure and who need to watch their sodium, um, 1,500 is what we're looking at. So, and some people have a higher tendency to be affected by sodium, African Americans, people older than 51, uh, people with diabetes, chronic kidney disease. So, a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of sodium in foods that don't necessarily, you don't think of them as salty, like um, cornflakes, higher in sodium than like french fries, it's crazy. So, you do need to be reading labels, obviously processed meats and all processed foods are high in sodium, and, and it, when you start cutting it down, again, like the sugar, you start to notice to the taste. So how do we reduce it? So you can get frozen bags of vegetables that don't have any sauces, you know, obviously cook fresh. Uh, use lots of herbs and spices, all right? So, you know, put thyme and rosemary and things on your roasted vegetables and, and into your um, stir fries. And um, uh, so just cu cut back uh, wherever you can. Just know that all the convenience foods, all the canned foods um, are going to be high in sodium. So like if you're using beans, you can rinse them before you put them into your recipe and that takes a lot of the sodium off. Um, and you know, again, just look for low sodium on the labels about today that you might incorporate, that you might think about doing, even if it's just turning that label around or even if it's looking for the lower sugar or even if it's um, using your, your natural sugars like fruit um, cutting down on the white products that are also sugar, um, maybe trying stevia in small amount versus something more chemically processed. You know, it's really up to you. So you just kind of want to look at your readiness ruler and kind of determine where you think you are and ask yourself, you know, if you wanted to make a change, what, what would it take? What might be the next steps? So just want to mention now, um, as a uh, if you're a Kaiser member, um, but even I think we mentioned last time, most all health um, uh, organizations now do offer some sort of wellness coaching. Um, so we do offer wellness coaching for healthy weight, healthy stress, physical activity, eating healthy, and quitting tobacco. So you would have your own health coach on the phone. And so that's a really great thing when you're looking to make a change is to get some support. So we also have a ton of online resources that are all free. So I thank you very much for your time and attention today. I really do coming over in the rain. And so if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill out the evaluation. There are two, I do apologize. One is for, um, for here and one is for me to take with me. Um, so if you don't mind just taking a moment to fill those both out. And I will, again, answer questions if you, if you like. <laughs>